Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized U.S. dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Ryan Moran, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Hey, Robert. You know it's it's pretty rare that I am actually honored to be on a show, <laughs> but um, I, I am truly honored to be on What Is Money. I love your principled stance. I love the people you bring on. I love that you've been standing for you've been standing for for a long time. So thank you for having me on. It's great to see you. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you for saying that. Um, love love doing it. It's a, it's become quite quite a fun job tell you that much (laughs) very good very good as you know obviously uh by way of quick introduction you are the founder of capitalism.com uh you're a mentor to a number of entrepreneurs you yourself are a serial entrepreneur uh you also have the capitalism.com podcast and perhaps most importantly you are a recent bitcoin convert so (laughs) welcome to the big orange club uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I am a noob. Yes, I'm, I'm a noob convert, if you will. And my my background is in Austrian economics and in entrepreneurship. And my I, I, up until like two, two and a half years ago, I was more in alignment with Peter Schiff's views mm. than maybe Michael Saylor or, or your own views mm. on Bitcoin. Fan of hard money fan of keeping as much power out of government's hands as possible, but didn't see Bitcoin as the perfect solution. Mm-hmm. And and in the Austrian world, I, I think that at least my my you know, I, I had a handful of professors that were that taught me in university when I was studying Austrian economics who were almost religious in their defense of Austrian economics. And I would I would throw Peter into that Peter Schiff into that camp as well. That that background I think at times can be so so specific in our ideals and our values that mm-hmm. at least in my case I was sort of shut off to other things that might match our values and advance the cause faster. And that's how I felt about Bitcoin. It wasn't until 2020 when two things happened. One, they printed money, like it was going away. And number two, I saw cancel culture reach a point in which I realized, oh, they could just stop stop using my services if the government owns all the money. Mm -hmm. You could just be blacklisted Mm -hmm. and go out of business unless there is some sort of private ownership to money. 
And that is where I would say that I saw the need for a Bitcoin-like alternative. Mm -hmm. And in looking at the field of options, Bitcoin is the best option that exists right now. Right? And I'm not at the point yet where I'm closed off to other options. I still think there's a lot of value in Web3 technology, even NFTs. But when it comes to long-term backbones of private trade, I've slowly come around to the realization that I was wrong about Bitcoin for many years. Mm. Yeah, you know, many people have gone through a similar journey. I mean, I, I myself dismissed Bitcoin at the outset. Um, in retrospect, this is the most ridiculous reason ever, but I think I, the name Bitcoin just sounded... <laughs> small and you know bits or scammy small, coins are small you know like it just sounds ridiculous <laughs> i didn't pay much attention initially um and the funny thing about gold bugs and bitcoiners is that they basically agree about all the problems right. like in almost total agreement on the problem set you know government's too big taxation is theft violation of private property all these things like yeah. we're well aligned on however they're divergent on the solution, right? Gold yeah. bugs think we have to go back to the gold standard. Bitcoiners think, and I agree with that gold has already failed, right? It just, it has this technological limitation as money that it's not super portable. So to scale it as a global monetary standard, you need something like a central bank. You have to centralize the custody and issue tokens on top of it called currency. Mm -hmm. uh, and that Maintaining that peg, putting that trust in a custodian or an institution to only issue the amount of paper that they have gold reserves to justify is the fundamental problem. Like you need to trust human beings to not be human beings. <laughs> and I just don't, I just don't think it ever works. So that removes so that option. So you're left with Bitcoin, basically. May, may I, may I make one, and again, I'm a Bitcoin noob here. So mm -hmm. forgive me if I'm poking a hole in your argument that you've filled many times. But from a philosophy of capitalism, I think that capitalism does require trust in human beings. Mm -hmm. I think like if, if human beings are the transactors, I think that by nature, capitalism is the system through a great number of strangers serve one another. Mm -hmm. My favorite definition of the word. And it's the system through which we trade which requires some level of trust, enforcement of contracts mm -hmm. and doing what you say you're going to do, building up a reputation, building up a brand. Mm -hmm. I mentor entrepreneurs who are building up mostly physical product brands. And the core of our thesis is that a brand is trust. Mm -hmm. You buy from Amazon because you trust Amazon. So you outsource your trust to Amazon. In a, in, in a, in a hard money decentralized economy, I think you reduce the need for there to be trust in the system. But I'm not yet convinced that you will have, you will remove the need for trust in human beings. Do you disagree with that? Well, so long as economics serves human beings, we'll always need to have some degree of trust in human beings. But I think the magic of the term decentralization is that you're not concentrating too much power in any single individual, right? You're, you're trying to make a system that is anti-fragile, basically, right? So that if one person or institution is taken out, it doesn't jeopardize the entire network. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's always going to be a degree of trust, but I think... It's actually minimizing the degree of interpersonal trust in the system. And I want to be very specific about that interpersonal trust, right? It's one thing to trust two plus two equals four, right? That's, that doesn't matter about anyone's opinion. Doesn't, I mean, contrary to what postmodernists may have you believe, <laughs> uh, it's something that's, it's supra personal, right? People's opinion can't change mathematics. So that's a more, uh, trustworthy place to put your trust in something like mathematics versus the opinions of 
central bankers or whatever it may be, right? And that's yeah. that's a fundamental difference between Bitcoin and central banking, right? You're you're trusting mathematics to govern the money supply versus trusting the the whimsical yeah. nature of, of human beings. So there's a value there to minimizing the degree of interpersonal trust necessary for human beings to cooperate. That's actually Nick Zabo's definition of money. He says that money is the trust minimized asset, basically. So it's the asset mm -hmm. you can store economic value in with the lowest degree or the lowest need to trust other people, right? Gold is a great example of this. It was promoted to money on the free market by virtue of its monetary properties, not because any government designated it as money or any individual said this thing is money now, right? It was this emergent, uh, emergent phenomena, frankly. And so I don't think you ever get rid of trust, but what, what did Adam Smith say? You know, it's not, the baker doesn't provide his customers bread because he's altruistic. It's not or, from the benevolence of the butcher from which we get our meat, but yes. in regard to his own self-interest. The self-interest, right? So what we're trying to do is align individual self-interest towards a greater collective outcome. That's how I understand capitalism, right? And the the proper limiting principle is private property, right? I should be able sure. to pursue my individual self-interest as much as I want, so long as I don't violate the boundary of other people's person or property. Right. That's right. Right. And as long as they reciprocate, then that's that's the best system. That's going to produce the most output per unit of input, the most peace, the most prosperity, the most innovation. So that's how I view it. It's that, that word trust, I agree with you. It's always there. But the degree to which we can reduce the need for interpersonal trust, the more the system can flourish economically. Yeah, there's there's something philosophically, and this this will get me tr in trouble with my with my contemporaries and my peers. But I I I I find it helpful and valuable to be able to persuade people who disagree with our viewpoint. And I found limitations in your explanation in persuading other people to a more free market view. And what I have sort of resigned myself to is is admitting that personally and privately i i find very little freedom in self interest meaning but pri privately and independently my freedom only goes so far as me being connected to other people in relationship with other people trading with other people giving to other people volunteering with other people, mentoring other people. Like my contribution to society is actually my greatest expression of freedom. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the powers that be, my freedom is encroached upon by being required to be in service to other people. It's this very interesting paradox where I think that the more freedom you give individuals the more giving and loving and in community they are, and the more power you give to governments to mandate or try to manipulate community, the less in community and the less giving we tend to be. Mm -hmm. And so I always find it helpful when debating with someone on the, who you might call left-leaning or uh, more of a socialist bend, that I agree with all of their values in principle. I want people to have cheap or free healthcare. I want equal economic opportunity. And the best way that I've seen be able to do that is with unfettered free markets, mm. with sound money principles, and with strong, independent entrepreneurs. Mm. And that has actually helped me persuade a lot of people who disagree with us to our side of the fence. Yeah, I agree. You know, so it's almost saying the same thing. The more power or authority you give to governments, actually to, to really simplify this, because we often try to distinguish between private businesses and government, like government, some other creature, but it's not, it's a business, right? Every human organization is a business. Just so happens with government that they derive their revenues from theft, right? Taxation, inflation, regulation. 
These are all violent. See, I would consider those fundamentally different things, but but I'm I'm li- I'm listening. Which things do you consider different? That if an entity requires theft in order to exist, then it is very different from a business. Well, I don't know what else you call it. I mean, they're generating economic gains through coercion. And it's a group of people that generate economic gains through coercion. So I agree. It's not your traditional not business. business. Well, but like a, but like a, but private business would not fall under that same definition. Well, here's, here's the only difference in my mind is consent, right? Private Correct. businesses generate revenues consensually, right? Their customers Correct. consensually exchange money for goods and services. Right. Government is the only legal non-consensual exchange. So you get a tax bill or the money is printed and you have right. no say so in the matter. It's, you know, pay or go to jail. Um, that's, you know, I don't know. Do you consider the mafia a business? I don't know. It's not a legal, <laughs> it's not a legal business, but well, they do me, revenues from similar means, but government I does think, it I think, under legal means. Yeah, but I would call the mafia an organization, but I wouldn't call them a business, right? Fair I mean, enough. I think I think what you are describing is is really the difference between sex and rape. Mm, yeah, we consider these very different things. It is. Right? It's the People same. People hate when act. I use that analogy. By the way, I use that yeah. exact analogy. <laughs> okay, I, I mean these these are these are the same act, but we treat them very differently as we should, because there are different rules when there is consent and not consent. Yes, and yeah. and and so I I see those as two fundamentally different things, and so that's why I push back against your statement of business is just like government because I think they're playing under two different rules and therefore are two different entities. Fine. We can use the term organization. I'm fine with that. Um, okay. Yeah, I do strongly agree. The difference between work and slavery, the difference between sex and rape, and the difference between taxation and a transaction is consent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's what it is. And the people hate that. They're like, what do you mean? Like, no, we need taxes. Who's going to build the roads? I'm like, I'm not arguing about building roads or not building roads. I'm just saying the exchange should be consensual. That's how you produce the most wealth and the most peace, all these things. So when we talk about government having more power, you're this equally saying you're advocating for more theft, more taxation, more inflation, which is the flip side of that is less individual freedom, right? The individual is keeping less of the fruits of their labor. Now to flip that, you'd say less power to government would be less violation of private property through taxation and inflation and more individual freedom. Now, the funny thing about that, like we use this word freedom, people, I think often think freedom from, you know, don't, whatever I'm free to do as I choose and as I please. Think about all these problems they want to be free from. Yes. There's also, they often, uh, the dichotomy is often made between freedom from, like freedom from coercion, freedom from harm, and freedom to, like the ability yes. to actually do something to to travel or whatever it may be. But I think the, the through line between freedom from and freedom to is optionality, right? There, it's an option at the end of the day. You have the option to be free from coercion. You have the option to fly from New York to LA. So the interesting thing to me is the more individual freedom we create in the world, this actually supports the market process of trade and innovation. And we're creating a larger option space for ourselves, right? 200 years ago, you couldn't fly from New York to LA. The technology did not exist, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But we, through support of individual freedom, private property rights, rule of law, the market process was able to create this technology we now all enjoy, you know, this global airline system that we can fly around and we have yeah. all these new options in terms of travel, which is a greater freedom, but it began with the freedom of the individual to get to that level of technological freedom. Yeah. So, and I think this, this is, this is where, again, I'm not, I'm not uh, all the way there on what you might call the Bitcoin maximalism. I think like even as as free market as I am, I think there's an argument to be made that the optionality was made greater by some government involvement up to this point. And you might say that the the government of my grandparents 
was a freer world mm -hmm. than a hundred years prior to them. I'm now almost a hundred years post them. And our generation is looking at this saying, okay, thank you, past generation. You got us here. How do we create the next chapter of freedom? And it's sort of, I think it's philosophically lazy. And I used to be this way, even as recently as a few years ago, to look at the world and bring my idealistic, even Austrian view and say, this is what it should be. And I'll fight against anything that doesn't match this. I think that is almost more religious thinking than it is productive thinking. Whereas where I am right now is more to say, here's where we are. And we've inherited the benefits and the problems of the previous generation. We're now saying, how do we develop freedom from those problems and the freedom to usher in the next chapter? And Bitcoin is a very strong option to open up that next chapter. Mm -hmm. But where I sort of disagree with some of our peers is to say that government never played a role up to this point. It's almost like it's run its course. Like, for, like government is a dinosaur that can be done away with in time. And we can be advocating for less and less, much, much, much less. And that as we're developing these new technologies, we may have more private organizations that are run on chain that are privately owned versus centralized. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, so for government, you know, like it's not, we can't clearly disentangle these things like, Oh, all government has right. always been evil. It hasn't contributed anything good ever. Although oftentimes when I'm talking on the show, it may sound like that. Um, <laughs> there's obvious, there's obvious, uh, flaws in the perfection of that notion because yeah well we needed to have private property rights enforced right so right. Enforce that's it. right that's now right. it's not th that i'm not justifying the existence of the state and libertarians it's tough right it's a crucify me for this but yeah yeah <laughs> but it happened it happened as a course of evolutionary the, the evolution of our socioeconomic systems we created this thing uh, also, wartime, right? Wartime has been uh, an infamous driver of innovation. Like countries go to war and all of a sudden we start figuring things out really fast, right? Like necessity is the mother of invention. So uh, obviously wartime, rampant violation of person and property, yet somehow contributing to innovation. So yeah, I mean, but the Austrian view would, you know, it's it's the brick, the broken window idea of if you didn't have those resources focused on wartime, where would those resources have gone? Sure. So, but but there's also, and I know we're going down some philosophical rabbit holes, which which I love, but it also begs the question if if, if you look at at certain parts of the world that have no governments or no no private property. Those are detractors or more people who are lean left would look at that and say, isn't that your ideal capitalist utopia? And I would say not at all because they have no private property, right? It would it would actually be a step in the direction for them to have governments that enforce contracts and protected mm -hmm. private property. That would be a step in the right direction for them. But we've benefited from that for a few hundred years. And so now we have the platform from which to say, we can take our society and develop something even better that might also solve the problem of lack of private property in third world countries. So this is the paradox that I spend way too much time thinking of mm. is the, is the, the, the solution that got us here is no longer the solution that will take us into the type of society that we want to build. Yeah. It's almost as though the state was a necessary evil, perhaps to get to this point. And I want to be careful here too, because I'm having a guy on the show in a couple of weeks, and this was new to me, but he's made a distinction between the state and government. All right. Libertarianism is not anti-government, mm. actually. Like we have means of dispute resolution, arbitration, all of these things. They want it to be privatized. They don't want it to be under the monopoly of violence. 
So that the government and governing mechanisms in an economy are distinct from the state, which is this. That's a helpful distinction. Central authority, monopoly on violence, you know, do as we say, not as we do kind of thing. So maybe you can have effective government in a libertarian world absent the state. But in my view, it's always come down to the profitability of coercion or violence. So how... Mm. Basically, human. my view is that human beings will do whatever is profitable. Morality be damned. So if it's profitable for me to steal, kill, and or destroy, there is some cohort of people on earth that will engage in that activity. Mm. And so the trick is how to make property really expensive, risky, and dangerous yeah. to violate or to attempt. Yeah, to violate. great point. And that's where Bitcoin is so such a fundamental breakthrough because... It's the first private property right independent of the state. It doesn't require enforcement by the state. It requires enforcement by the mining network. And it requires social consensus by nodes. And if you custody it properly, it's almost impossible to violate. Like if you're custodying your Bitcoin in a multi-sig or multi-key solution, it's the most expensive form of private property to steal mm. in human history. Mm. So all of these... This puts a lot of economic pressure, I think, on the business model or the organizational model, let's say, of statism itself, that here's an organization that preys on private property rights to exist. Well, all of a sudden, private property rights are much more expensive to violate. So doesn't that shrink this business over time? And that's the real, I think that's the first clearing in the Bitcoin rabbit hole where you're like, holy shit, how yeah. this thing could really be transformational in a fundamental way that no one ever imagined. Like libertarian, maybe you could say Hayek, he made that, he has that famous quote, we're never going to get money out of the hands of government unless by some sly roundabout way we introduce something they cannot stop. That was like probably the closest prediction. There've been others mm -hmm. actually, but that's from, a, from an, an Austrian economist. I think that's the best prediction for Bitcoin I've ever heard. Yeah, the, the, one of the the big light bulb moments for me was in reading the Bitcoin Standard, hearing the argument made. It was it was an argument for sound money, not necessarily for Bitcoin, but but the description of how fiat money made it easier for governments to go to war. Yes, and that description was one of those moments where I had to put my pen down and think for a second. Yeah. Right. Because because when you, you know, although my background is in Austrian economics, being in the world for a certain number of years, you kind of you think more practically, more practically, if yeah. you will. And then when you hear such a fundamental philosophical argument like that, that makes you realize that whoever controls the money supply controls the violence. Mm -hmm. It just it just makes you put your pen down and and rethink how you see the world. Mm -hmm. And again, where where I stand is that the events of the last few years reconvinced me for the need of a Bitcoin like alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, wh whether that is whether that is something that doesn't exist yet, or it is a Bitcoin or it's Web three. I'm sort of open as long as it matches the values that you and I talk about, which is removing power from the hands of the state and putting it back into the hands of individuals. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's a common path many Bitcoiners have taken. Like Bitcoin's interesting. All these other things are interesting. And then eventually you come back to Bitcoin being perhaps the only viable solution in the whole wave of innovation that we that's popularly called crypto today. And yeah, I don't know. The, I guess the the other big light bulb, which is very related to what you just said, printing money is a violation of private property. That's mm -hmm. all it is. It can right. be nothing else. And this is why I think it's so important for people to understand money, because if you just think one layer deep, oh, we don't have enough money, we'll print some more. That should solve it. But you're not thinking about what money actually is, right? It's just a representation of capital. It's not capital itself. Mm -hmm. So when you print money, you're not creating any new wealth, no new factories, equipment, knowledge, nothing. You're just re out, you're redistributing it, basically. And so that 
has been the covert funding mechanism for World War I, World War II, right? The reason these wars yeah. got so colossal is because individual states were not confined to their balance sheet. They could now tap into the balance sheet of everyone using the currency, and they could just confiscate all the wealth from them through inflation. So, yeah, I don't, I can't imagine a much larger moral or ethical case for sound money other than preventing World War III. Yeah, of course. And once again, we're, I think we're faced with the paradox of it, it again, like you said, we, we could get crucified for these this rabbit hole, but you might make the argument that even that was necessary to get to this point. Right. I, I don't huh. it, it's it's of no use to go back and argue the past, but where I think we are now is that if we want to avoid having a similar thing in the future. Sound money slash Bitcoin looks like a really attra attractive alternative to pr to create a more peaceful world. Yes. Yeah, I uh, agreed. Maybe those atrocities were necessary for humans to learn the hard way. Uh, Maybe. I know. I mean, it does seem the way a lot of us are programmed that we just have to kind of bang our head into the wall or touch the hot stove before we learn. <laughs> um. But hopefully, you know, I, I do believe we can also learn through the experiences of others, right? That's the the blessing of human rationality. So hopefully we don't have to keep repeating <laughs> the world wars to learn about that. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I'll give a company some money in case shit happens. <laughs> now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download this state of the art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three-day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all-around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup, including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. 
Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Let me ask you this. So you, you mentioned you had a good definition for capitalism earlier. We said we were going to talk about this, though. Like, what is your, you had a definition of money I think you wanted to share. Well, and you know it's my favorite question, so I have to ask you: What is money? I, I, I love I love that you asked this question, but I asked this question from a completely different context than you. Like I, I see money as the ability to exchange; is the way that we make agreements or focus attention. Mm. We exchange money so that we each agree where we are going to put our attention. You build a building mm. by putting a certain amount of capital that gets all parties who are participating to focus on building this building. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's like the way it's like the, the physical manifestation of focus. Mm -hmm. But I asked this question from a different context when I'm working with entrepreneurs, because the business model of capitalism.com is that we teach entrepreneurship. We, we teach entrepreneurs and we excel in getting entrepreneurs to their, their first, their first million. That's our bread and butter. And it's so interesting to see the, the beliefs that people bring to entrepreneurship that they have about money and that their beliefs about money either support or hinder their success as an entrepreneur. Whereas money is just the way that we're focusing attention and creating exchange between each other. If you can get an entrepreneur to realize that money isn't actually real, that money is just a mechanism through which we trade, it it almost um, meld, melts their brain in the same way hmm. that you might have had your brain melt when you saw how big Bitcoin could get. That it's almost a fundamental new way to view the world. Because we have these stories about, well, money is freedom. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Money, doesn't equal. money and freedom are completely unattached. One, They are completely different things. You can have a lot of money and not be free. You can have a lot of money and be free. Mm. The opposites are true too. They're, they are separated. They are mutually exclusive. And if you believe that money is free, then you're always dependent on money for freedom and therefore you're a slave to money. That's a very interesting paradox. Mm. And so if you can get an entrepreneur specifically or an investor to see that money is the expression of focus, the expression of value, the ironic thing is then they start aligning their focus and their value appropriately and they start making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so money is a made up idea to give ourselves permission to focus and to serve one another. That is my definition of money. I like that. The, it's funny you described it as kind of a means of allocating our attention. I wrote yeah. a blog series on that. I, that was one of my answers to the question, what is money? Money is an attention allocation technology. Yes, it is. It's just telling yes. us where, you know, what is, what relevant features of the world should we be, putting our attention towards, right? It's a, it's a way of signaling, right? It's, and we say this all the time, actions speak louder than words, obviously. Well, what is capital? Capital is the result of many, 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 many actions, right? It takes a lot of actions to get your first million or whatever the piece of capital yeah. is. Well, that carries a lot more weight than any individual action, right? Someone puts a million bucks into a deal that right. says a lot more than what they did last night at dinner, something like that. Right. That's right. So agreed with all that. I would, again, maybe this is where the term freedom is ambiguous because I agree money is not freedom per se, but if we say, if we're defining freedom as optionality, then there's a pretty strong correlation because money is just pure optionality in the marketplace. But that doesn't mean money is going to give you psychological freedom. 
right? You can't just be rich and like be internally free, I guess. Right? I would classify that as more, more like something like the absence of fear, right? That would be so psychologically for sure. Yes. Yeah, psychologically sure. free. So well, that you, you freedom have to, gets muddied, you know, it gets. Well, well, you need resources in order to have optionality. Yes. And, and money is the Economic most resource. easily exchanged resource. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so again, I think money is the manifestation of choice or focus, mm-hmm. but I don't think that it necessarily is the driver of freedom and choices. I agree with that. I agree with that. It's um, what someone else said this. It's one of the most salient signals that humans can communicate, basically. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Someone's investing in your project or whatever. That means they believe in you, right? They've, they've, they're putting yes. their skin in the game. They're putting their energy, their life force behind you. That That's says right. a lot more than standing on the sideline and applauding your efforts, right? It speaks much more. The volume is much louder in that action of investing versus applauding. Yeah. that In, in the same way, purchasing something says a lot more yes. than providing feedback for something. I, I remember I was buying a car and uh, I test drove the car and the, the salesperson says, uh, did you like it? I said, yeah, I liked it. And he said, do you want to own it? And I said, I might like to own it, but I don't want to buy it. <laughs> and, and, and just in expressing that it was like, I like this enough to have it, right? But I don't like this enough to spend resources right. on it. And so, which which is the greater expression of value? Right. If you say you like it, or if you spend money on it, one hundred percent. Yeah, the skin in the game. It is a medium that imparts skin in the game, right? Because, like, given a free choice, everyone's going to choose to own the private island, obviously. <laughs> when the price tag is associated with the ownership, you get a lot fewer people ponying up right. the, the private island. Um, that's, right. that's an interesting take. So you mentioned too, your background is in Austrian economics, but you thought that perhaps that may have given you some hesitancy about Bitcoin originally. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you brought up Schiff early on, like that's a guy that again, Gold bug, right? Agrees with Bitcoiners on all the problem set, but disagrees on the solution. What, what is it about? Um, because for me, it was the opposite. Austrian economics actually clarified a lot of my thinking around Bitcoin. So sure. I'm wondering what what aspects of Austrian economics gave you hesitancy about Bitcoin? Well, or... Robert, I I have a religious background. You know, I went to I went to college, Indiana Wesleyan University thought I was going to be a pastor for a good part of my life, uh, ended up studying economics. And so there's a, there's a religious, there's a religious undertone to my formative years, but also a religious undertone to the school of, of, of economics hmm. that I was taught because, uh, instead of becoming a pastor, I studied business and economics. And so I, I I think there is, at least in my experience, or my experience was a very black and white view to how the world should be, how the government should be, how the economy should operate. And anything that violated a religious view is going to be seen as bad. Right. Mm-hmm. There's there's very little flexibility in a religious view of anything. Mm. And I mean religious by the by the idea of black and white and no fundamentalism. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think Bitcoin was such a radical idea and such a new idea from w- where most of us that come from a the school of thought of Austrian economics that it took some time to sort of soften to the idea of it because Bitcoin isn't perfect. Mm. It's very good. It's very good. But there are still some like philosophical questions or technologies that we haven't quite worked out yet or some use cases that 
we haven't seen yet. We don't have 500 years of history to be able to compare to. And so I think, I think it violates the fundamental view in the same way that, you know, uh, rock music was a threat to churches. Mm. It's, 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 it's a new way of viewing the expression of values that mm -hmm. we might agree on, but our backgrounds and fundamentalist views prevent us from adopting at least quickly. And right. I think that's okay. Like new ideas shouldn't always be accepted right away. That's when you get crypto pump and dumps. Right. But I think we're starting to realize that Bitcoin is winning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a strange one because I think one of the most useful answers i guess to the question what is money is just when you arrive at the properties of good money and people will name you know anywhere between three to 30 properties of useful money um i found the austrian economic and libertarian philosopher gary north very clarifying on this he narr narrows it down to five right good you want money that's divisible durable recognizable portable scarce and so when you understand that that's, these are the attributes you want in a good money. This is, this is what you want the tool to do, to do these things. Yeah. It helps you get past the specific instantiation of those things. Like all of a sudden my, my view with gold bugs is they, they're too attached to the vehicle that best satisfied those properties historically, which is gold, right? Gold. Right. Wants that's right. Most, divisible, durable, recognizable, portable, scarce thing we ever had. That doesn't mean that it's the most optimal money we will ever have, right? So you you almost have to get one layer beneath the physical instantiation of the money to really understand what we're looking for. And I think when you, when you look at money through that lens, and I, again, I got this from Austrian economics, that's why it was so clarifying for me, that you can now see a potential future where gold is actually supplanted, right? Supplanted by yeah, superior sure. form of money, which um, again, looking at Bitcoin through a similar lens, I think it just, it's superior to gold. So therefore people will favor the superior monetary technology. The time may come in our lifetimes or not that something better than Bitcoin arrives. Mm. And if that is the case, there will likely be a lot of resistance yeah, from sure. Bitcoin maximalists. We'll be the old gold bugs by then. <laughs> exactly that, right? And so it, in some ways, we're all humans and we are all vulnerable to religious thinking mm -hmm. of our way of operating that got us to the point, this point is superior to anything new, mm -hmm. right? And I think since even you are a, a, a Bitcoin maximalist, you've seen enough projects come and go and opportunities come and go and make promises and go away that you're pretty set in your position that Bitcoin is the best alternative and that there's it's extremely rare that anything soon is going to come along and supplant it or replace it. That's, mm. that's Peter Schiff and gold, <laughs> you know? And, and so I think we are all vulnerable to that type of thinking based on the experience that gets us here. Yeah, I, I would agree with that to an extent. So I do think, you know, the old adage, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. There's some truth in that, right? There's a reason Bitcoin is generational, right? Older people tend to not get it as sure. much as younger people, right? Um, so there's definitely some truth in that, but I would add, there's definitely the my my empirical observational experience of seeing shitcoin after shitcoin project yeah. the moon and catastrophically implode. But there's also the theoretical, the rationalistic view that I don't know, again, if you're looking at Bitcoin, as money, right? It's perfected these properties of, I won't say perfected, virtually perfected 
It's infinitely divisible, unlimited durability. You can audit the entire supply, you know, fully counterfeit resistant, very portable. Obviously, it's just information and it has a fixed supply of 21 million. So it's basically like maxed out the design space for good money. So it's not just the the observation of shit coins failing. There's also a theoretical underpinning. It's like rat like from a rational standpoint, if a new money did emerge that outcompeted Bitcoin, what would it look like? What would it do? Mm -hmm. So that like it's hard. No one's conceptualized, in my opinion, no one's conceptualized anything where any gap, let's say, in Bitcoin's attributes is good money. So like, okay, that's one thing. Maybe I have blind spots. Maybe I have, there's a property or three that I don't know about good money that some other technology will figure out. But the last piece to this argument that's really strong is even if that were the case and shitcoin XYZ has three new properties that Bitcoin doesn't have and we really need in good money, well, Bitcoin is open source, right? Bitcoin still has this capacity to absorb feature set from other competitive technologies. So it, it still maintains this ability to adapt. It's not like, like gold doesn't adapt really, right? You don't, but, you can't but, but do a people would have made made similar gold. arguments for, for gold for hundreds of years, right? Because they couldn't conceive anything different. And because the technology didn't exist for Bitcoin, the chance exists that in a hundred years, there may be something completely different that we can't see. Of course. And my, my, my original point was just that I think the Bitcoin maximalists of today will be the gold bugs of yesterday yeah. if and when that system comes along, because we're all sort of vulnerable to that religious thinking if we're not more committed to values than we are about being right. Yeah, and I agree with that. Like, I always want to reserve the humility to be wrong, right? Especially yeah. a long Just time. Just rare today. Like, well, if you're talking 100 plus years in the future, you're almost certainly fucking wrong. No matter what, you're, <laughs> you're almost guaranteed to be wrong about whatever you think. Um, but the religious thing is interesting because I don't know. It seems to me like humans are kind of like religious animals in a way, right? That we, sure, you know, we create these stories that we inhabit, yes, and then we defend them or we uh, we advance them. So I don't know that you can get out of that ever, you know. Um, there's there's a religious instinct, I guess, in just being human. And that may I sound like right. a dirty word. People will be like, oh, no, I'm a scientific atheist. But I would argue that those people haven't actually looked at their fundamental presuppositions because science itself is based on the faith that the structures we have up here, the structures of intelligibility will track to the structures of reality. That's just a faith. We don't have a proof for that. You can't prove that. Yet the entire enterprise of science is suspended on top of that faith. Yeah, I mean, we—I would call them assumptions. You would call them faith, but we're we're talking about the same thing. I think there are there's religiosity in you know Republican thinking and Democratic thinking. I'll tell you, Robert, my favorite religion in the whole world right now, anyway, is the World Economic Forum. <laughs> like, like they're these elaborate the, re, the, re, the religious views that people have about what they see as this evil organization that I see as very benign is fascinating to me because I think it is just the most beautiful example I've ever seen of confirmation bias. Hmm. Now we saw like we, I think we saw a ton of religious thinking while Trump was president, where everything that he did was he could he wore a black shirt and you know it was it was racist. Mm -hmm. And now I think the right is having their day. Right wing people are having their their day where they see evil reflected in everything that is going on, and I see that as just religious. Mm. Um, so I agree with your point that I think we might just be religious animals. We all are sort of vulnerable to this idea of falling into tribe or herd mentality if we're not consistently questioning our principles mm -hmm. and the assumptions that we have about the beliefs that we hold to. And I think the pursuit of truth is – most people see the pursuit of truth as going out and getting more information that confirms their biases. I think the pursuit of truth 
is going in and finding where we have gaps in our biases, Mm -hmm. where we have gaps in our fundamental understanding. And most people don't have the benefit of what you and I do, which is a religious deconstruction. Being raised religious and then poking holes in that argument and saying, I think maybe the way that I view the world was fundamentally flawed and having to rethink through all that Mm -hmm. and reconstruct it, rebuild the structure of how we see the world. I don't think most people have had to do that. But if you've gone through or rethinking of your faith or your background or your political views or your economic views, something that you adhere to religiously, I think you once you go through that, you see the benefit in the pursuit of truth and questioning all of your assumptions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, even in science, right? There's no proving anything in science. There's just disproving hypotheses. Yes. Right. Whatever's left over... Whatever cannot be disproven <laughs> yeah. is science, basically. So that's right. Um, and yeah, the the religious thing is inter- like just on a personal thing. I definitely was raised Christian, then went through a deconstruction phase in my teens, early twenties, but now mid thirties, I've kind of come full circle. I'm like, wait, there's all kinds of things yeah. in this structure that matter a lot to civilization, like. But anyway, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. I just would say that um, I, I take a lot of humility towards that, right? There's all, you know, yeah, you and me both. Millions and millions of people have benefited from this thing. It's like, what does Peterson say? Like, before you go and criticize the world, clean up your room kind of deal. Like, yeah, yeah. set um, your house in perfect order before you judge the world. Exactly. So um, I kind of take that approach there. I want to talk about the World Economic Forum, though. Oh, okay. yes. My favorite how, conversation. How do you square their advertisement, you'll own nothing and be happy, which I don't think there's a more antithetical statement about to capitalism, let's say. How do you square that with, I, I assume you're a capitalist running capitalism.com. How do you square You would hope so, yeah. Yeah, although although when I talk about the world, I can't economic forum people do accuse me of being a paid plant for the world economic forum what better way to infiltrate than the owner of capitalism.com shilling for the wef so i i I have an answer for you but first i have a question for you where or who said you will own nothing and be happy i just saw the advert online had a world economic forum of guy smiling and it says you'll own nothing and be happy could have been, uh, maybe it's not even a World Economic Forum advert. I don't know, but that's where I saw it. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people think they've seen a quote of Klaus Schwab or they've seen a video of the World Economic Forum touting this as one of their values, mm-hmm. uh, but they're false memories. So the World Economic Forum did publish a piece written by Ida Aukin. Uh, in 2016, in which she wrote a fiction piece in the voice of a fictional character in a fictional city in a fictional time. And in that time, things were delivered by drone. And so there was no need to own anything unless you wanted to. It was a fiction piece. And uh, this got picked up in uh, a Facebook video that had eight predictions for the world. And they included, you'll own nothing and be happy, which was a throwback to that fiction piece, that will eat less meat, that will go to Mars, that there'll be 3D printing of organs. And this is 2016. And people have taken the one prediction, the one prediction, which was really saying, you won't need to own anything unless you want to. And they took that as the agenda of the World Economic Forum. And it's all often lumped into Agenda 2030, published by the UN, which actually has a statement in it of one of the agendas of, of, of Agenda 2030 is the private ownership of land and property to all, basically making... Land and personal ownership 
more accessible specifically to people in third world countries. So like a defense of private property rights mm. in countries that don't have it. So when the, the argument is often based that there is anti world economic form. And it's so great. We're talking about this because it's Davos week as we're sitting here mm-hmm. uh, recording this, but often the fundamental argument against the world, the world economic forum is this idea that they stand for you'll own nothing and be happy. And um, it's, nowhere in their it's it's nowhere in their agenda at all it was a fiction piece what about the advert i mean that's the thing that went viral the guy the guy that's smiling yeah world economic form in the corner corner and there's the only text you'll own nothing and be happy that's not real well it's a it's a prediction for 2030 again based in a fiction article so they also have in that same video that will be 3D printing organs, which capitalists have been all for for years. Mm-hmm. But we don't have discussions seven years later about how evil the World Economic Forum is because they think that in the future we'll 3D print organs. There's also the statement they predict that we'll go to Mars. Mm-hmm. Right. So none of those things are here. none of those things are inconsistent with capitalism, though. Going to Mars, printing right. organs. I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem with saying you'll own nothing. I mean, that's that's an attack on civilization itself. What do you think it means to own nothing? Because some people think that means that you will you will have no right to own anything. And if that's the case, then of course we push against that. I don't but think that's you no own nothing state. actually, because you everyone owns right. their own body. Right. You yes. can't alienate that that property. And even if you Uberize everything and drones deliver everything and Amazon delivers everything and you rent everything, someone still owns Amazon and Uber stock. Mm -hmm. So nowhere in the statement of own nothing and be happy does it mean that there's no private ownership. It just means you won't have stuff, which is just the trend of the world. My best best friend started a company called RVShare.com because he had an RV and it was not being used half the time. So we started a company in which you can just rent RVs and people have sure. businesses built on top of it. So there's been much said about this statement of you'll own nothing and be happy. And it's a total nothing murder. Well, that's fine. But even to rent things, you need to have private property interest in totally. to pay for totally. the thing you're renting. So, um, all right. Even if I, I, again, I don't know. I haven't done the, research to see what it whatever but even if i just believed you and took that at face value i have seen klaus schwab say we need to move to a world where there's no meat eating i have heard him talk about the abolition of private property i'd love to see that clip because if if that's an actual clip it might change my mind and so i'm inviting also, you to send that to me i will look that up i tweeted about it several months ago i'll see if i can find it they also clearly support taxation, central banking, yes, bug eating. <laughs> uh, well, the, the, well, hold on. Well, so the bug eating is funny because bug e- <laughs> cricket protein was all the rage in our community eight and ten years ago. The the guys who started Magic Spoon, the cereal, started a company called Exo Protein in which they were manufacturing cricket flour because Mm -hmm. it was a cleaner, more macro-friendly, more sustainable form of protein, and they were all about it, right? Now, the company didn't grow to the level that was expected, but it made enough of a dent to where some people said, yeah, I mean, in the future, that could work. So the bug eating thing is, is way overblown, but where there are plenty of things philosophically to disagree with an organization like the World Economic Forum or Klaus Schwab, you know, personally, there's plenty of things in the Great Reset that Mm -hmm. I disagree with politically. I just don't see the institution as particularly influential. Mm. Most of what they have advocated for has failed. And I I just don't see it as particularly nefarious like many of my libertarian counterparts seem to believe. Yeah, and I don't know. I would... I don't know how nefarious it is, but any organization advocating for central banking, taxation, central planning, like that, none of that works for me. Like in the world I live in, I refuse. I refuse all of that. I say no to all of that. Um, 
There's also just the hypocrisy of reducing carbon footprint while there are just rows of private jets of all these motherfuckers in Davos. Like that doesn't sit too well either. You're just you're sure, that's fine. blatantly blatantly hypocritical. Sure, so, that's fine. Um, at the end of the day, it's just life, liberty, property, and leave everyone alone. Everyone mind their own business. Amen. That's how I Amen. think things should work. That's my moral and economic prescription for the world. And anyone that anyone or any organization that goes against that, I have a real problem with. Um, but admittedly, I you know haven't done a deep dive on the World Economic Forum. I just see them getting yeah. I would I would I yeah. would challenge you. And again, I want you to send me this this clip. But I would be willing to bet that if you didn't read the headlines, that you'd find far less to disagree with than you might assume. Again, my 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 argument for the WF is not a a, a defense of them or pro WF. It's just I think they're a non-issue. Mm. I think they're a non-factor. I think the Bitcoin movement is more powerful than the World Economic Forum. I think oh, that yeah. private yeah. private property, I think that capitalism, I think that individual entrepreneurs are more influential than uh, a group of elites getting together and listening to Yuval Harari talk. You know, th this this is just, it, to me, it is, it's a complete non-issue. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard that part of that speech too, where he talked about, Harari was saying we may need to tax the flows of information because money was getting beyond our ability to control. When I say our, I mean, speaking from his perspective of the central planner, it's harder and harder to tax economic flows in a world of digital money. So we may need to tax information. Like stuff like that is pretty insane. You talk about taxing. Yeah, like that's anti. And what, once again, there's plenty of things to disagree with in terms of individuals. Yeah. But the forum itself is just a bunch of people from different backgrounds getting together and giving their view on the world. And yeah. so when we cherry pick, like I got I got into this debate with my friend JP Sears, like if you cherry pick all the people that you don't like on the stage, of course mm -hmm. you can create a narrative sure. of it being a, like a, a group of bad actors, but we can just as easily pick the people that actually agree with our views on on money yeah. or agree with our views on economics. They're there too. Yeah. And it's just there's just them getting together and saying, like, I see the world this way as it, it's a conference. Yeah. yeah. It's not particularly as influential as as people give it to me. But in our world, like, I mean, think about how far we've come as a community of again, like I'm a noob. Like you guys are way ahead of me in terms of how long you've been pursuing this. But like our ideals of small government and private property and freedom look how far we've come and we need an enemy and mm -hmm. right now that enemy is the world economic forum sure. and so you know if it empowers our side to keep moving and keep fighting for freedom and personal responsibility mazel tov yeah. i just think it's a, an imperfect enemy because it's easy yeah. to debunk the theories about them yeah fair enough I and mean, you very well could have a point there um but man, it's just so fun making memes about them. And <laughs> I think that's why it survived, <laughs> Robert. <laughs> Ryan, man, this has been a heck of a conversation. Um, it's been where fun. can people find you online? My website's easy to find. It's called capitalism.com. Best way to find me is probably the capitalism.com podcast. My, my core focus is helping entrepreneurs build profitable businesses and, uh, all the details are at capitalism.com. And then my my socials are all my personal, Ryan Daniel Moran on Instagram, Twitter, all those places. Awesome. We'll thanks thanks for having me, Robert. It's a, it's a real honor to be on, on the show. Thanks for what yeah, you're man. doing in the world. Glad to have you. And we'll link to everything in the show notes and appreciate you doing this. Good to see you. Thank you.